On this hunt, I'm in central British Columbia with my friend Ryan Callahan, and we're doing a float trip for moose. Been by moves. Ah! Oh my god. Oh, he's up. Run. Oh my god. Run. 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 I'm Steven Ranella. To me, hunting isn't only about the pursuit of an animal, it's about who we are and what we're made of. I live to hunt and hunt to live. I am a meat eater. On this hunt, we're in central British Columbia doing a river trip for moose. This country is thick and dank. You can't see 10 yards when you get in the woods here. So rather than a spot and stalk game or a still hunting game, we're gonna try to focus on calling and see if we can bring a bull in. There's a good chance this could happen because the rut's coming on. We got it on good authority from some locals that the bulls are starting to make a little noise. They're starting to pair up with cows. So the thing we're going to be doing is going down this river and trying to hunt sign. We're going to hit meadows, beaver ponds, look for fresh stuff. If we smell them, we start hearing them, we start seeing them, we're going to start calling to them and maybe suck in a big bull. Along for the ride is my friend Ryan Callahan, who I know via the Idaho-based apparel company First Light, where he works. But he's got a long history as a big game guide, and he does some work for an outfitter up here in BC. Ryan abides by a derivation on that old Teddy Roosevelt quote, speak softly and wear a big stash. But one noise that the guy does reliably make is a moose call. If a moose can be called in, Ryan will do it. Of all the types of wilderness travel, there's something special about a float. There's a real sense of inevitability and adventure that comes from giving in to the water's weight. Once you shove off, there's only one way to go. You can't see far, just bend to bend, but still you know it might take you to some strange and distant place. But make no mistake, this is no pleasure cruise. It's not the deepest or widest river, and even a small down tree can block the whole thing, which means an hour's worth of extra work trimming off sharp branches and then dragging a fully loaded raft up and over. Plus, not only do we have to stay vigilant in our search for moose sign, but we also have to be mindful of the grizzlies that could be just about anywhere in here, including the middle of the river. One of the things we're doing as we drift along here is just checking anywhere that might hold tracks. Try to find areas that got fresh activity, like a find area that has a bowl in it. You can see old stuff here. This has been rained on. You can see it's an old grizzly track. Here's the pad. Toes, claws. It just rained. So on one hand, it's frustrating because you're not gonna be seeing you know, so much of the evidence has been destroyed. But on the other hand, if you do see something, you know you're on something good. There's an old moose track there. There's been moose crossing. It's like a cow, probably, not a big one, maybe a calf, too. Nothing earth shattering, but good evidence. Better no tracks. It's a constant stop and start, because chances are we're not going to see anything from the boat. It's not all work, though. There's plenty of time to do a little fishing as we go along. There's been a lot of rain over the last few days, and the river's high, and it looks like a deep, big, slow pocket that might hold bull trout. And I've never caught a bull trout. Almost everywhere that bull trout exists in streams and rivers are hands off. You can target them, catch and release, but in this river, single hook, and that hook's gotta be barbless. They wanna make sure if you catch the fish, you can pull the hook out and let them go. The bull trout are likely to be lying deep down in slow, sluggish water. The trick is to deliver your lure or fly right in their face, where even the laziest fish can't help itself but grab it. Ah! Was that him? Yeah. <laughs> That's a bull trout. Nice, man. There he is. Sweet! Nice. 
First bull trout ever. Awesome, man. Normally, I'm a catch and cook kind of guy, preferring to land one fish and eat it rather than land 20 and let them all go with little holes in their mouths. But sometimes your general preferences take a back seat under special circumstances. First bull trout ever caught, man. Heck yeah. So now that I can mark that goal off my list, Ryan and I return to our primary quest, filling this tiny raft up with moose meat. While on our float, we look into the dense timber for open patches of sunlight or tall grass or like a hole in the trees. If it looks promising, we beach the raft and mosey in to check for sign. One big beaver pond here. They kind of got the wall like they have, they kind of dammed up. So this water in here actually sits higher than the river. We're gonna check the fresh side and maybe do some calling. Moose are creatures of edge habitats, places where different systems come together, creating a varied environment. Places like beaver ponds, meadows, and willow-covered gravel bars. Pretty much any open area that breaks up the monotony of the timber. While searching one network of side channels, a couple things suddenly happen all at once. Hey, there's a bed right here. We swear that we hear the distant oomph of a bull moose, and I stumble onto a fresh bed. We listen again, but neither of us can be entirely sure what we heard. I walked right in on a bedded bull. Didn't see it, but could hear the <laughs> So I think we just be patient. We have the wind in our face now. The sieve set up to where if I can call this bull out, just hopefully he's curious enough to see what crashed his bedroom. been calling for a long time and nothing's happened. My mind starts playing tricks on me. I know I heard a bull, but did I? I want to push ahead in case the bull is farther than we initially thought. is calling and he's headed our way. I didn't even get to see it. You didn't see it? No. You called him right in. <laughs> I had to take a brisket shot on him. 
I couldn't see him at all. I can't believe that happened. I gotta go over and hit him again. It wasn't the ideal shot angle, but I went with it anyway. I was busted by that moose, and I didn't want to risk him taking off. So like I said, I took a brisket shot, head on in the area just below the neck. I'm worried it wasn't a fatal shot, and sure enough, the moose isn't lying where I'd seen it drop. Already I've got that feeling in the pit of my stomach. You screwed up. Steve, I'm gonna go up this one. Oh, oh, oh. Hold it. Now I've got myself in a questionable situation, chasing a moose through thick brush. You got him? Yeah, I got him. <laughs> oh my god. Oh. He's up! Run! Oh my god. Get out of the way! Uh, I got him. The bull was down. But as I came up on him, I could see that he was still alive. When I went to finish him off, my rifle didn't fire. Oh my god. Oh Run! Oh my god. Run! Get away! Run! Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Run! Yo. Get out of the way! Get out of the way! You guys okay? Yeah, I got run over, but he charged me. So stay out of the way here. Yeah. God. Everybody's good? Yeah. Well, I'm glad to see you standing on your own two feet. Holy smokes, I'm still in shock. You should be. I go over foolishly too soon. And you stood up. And you know, and eventually I got in there two goals to him. He charged me to hit me in the back. I can still feel it. <laughs> he hit me right here. Really? Yeah, is that his blood on me? Did he get through my waders? Yeah, see that? That's his blood on me. Oh. He run me right over. You know better than that. Apparently not. Apparently. <laughs> Yeah, isn't that his? I'm not, that's not mine. We may need to check you out. I don't know. Well, is there any holes or anything in me? <laughs> no. Is there blood back there? There's a little bit. Yeah, it ain't mine. Look. That's him from charging me. Got run over my moose. Ooh. Holy smokes. Whew, that's a big critter. Man, that thing about got me, man. I can't believe that. Boy, these things are huge. I've walked up on five dead bull moose in my life. Each time I think the same thing. What do we do now? What a beast, man. Go. These animals are monsters, and there's a ton of work ahead of us. We got to get it gutted and butchered, which means we'll be camped out here for the night. And there's a sizable storm rolling our way. Straight this way? Yeah, straight that way.
hail. Wow, this is wild. gonna do on this moose here is we're gonna take it out in probably four pieces per side so eight total pieces it's dark ready we're just getting started it's gonna be a long chore but no one's really relishing the idea of climbing into all this brush in the morning to check if there's a grizzly in here or not you wouldn't know if there was or wasn't until you were 10 yards away at which point it would be a little bit late yeah so that's why we're doing this tonight it'd be very nice just to roll the guts out and come back in the morning and do this at daylight but it's just, it's probably not smart. Yeah. Would be my guess anyway. Man, that's a beautiful cut of meat. Yes. Look at that thing. <laughs> Here's a back strap off that bull. Size of hunk of meat. A common refrain among moose hunters is that the work doesn't actually begin until the animal hits the ground. And there's plenty of truth to that. I can still feel a little piece of every moose I ever pack. Your knees and shoulders come out of the experience a little bit changed. the brisket shot I took on this moose as a mistake. I also know how easy it is to let desire get in the way of good decision making. In the moment, even though something in the back of my head said don't, something else said you want that moose and here it is. And regardless of how it worked out in the end, things took a bad turn and I'll never take that kind of shot again. There's little to do now but drift down toward our takeout. I use the time to remind myself again and again just how close to disaster my recklessness brought. But if there's one thing that could take my mind off moose hunting mistakes, it's a moose hunting meal. I'm gonna grill up huge moose steaks from the round and I'm gonna top them with roasted bone marrow. The closest thing to butter that you can find on an animal is bone marrow. And the best place to get the marrow is right out of the femur. Man, this thing is monstrous. So yeah, roast that thing in a fire and then smack it open. There'll be a slug of marrow in there bigger than your thumb. That'll do us. Yeah. I'm gonna put this bone in the fire. When you're doing these, you gotta be careful. Like they cook pretty fast. If you let it go too long, the bone will start to crack. So you just wind up with like embers inside there. I'm gonna lay this bone like that, put some embers around it, and just keep an eye on it. That's a moose steak with a marrow sauce. Try that. <laughs> Dang. Oh my God, that's good, man. Mm -hmm. Man. That's unreal. That's probably the highest quality animal I've shot in a long time right there. There's no chew to it at all. That's amazing. That is ridiculous. 
The marrow is awesome. Yeah, the marrow really makes it rich, you know. I mean, this is amazing. Like any longtime hunter, I've accumulated a few close calls over the years. You learn from them, you pass the knowledge down. I'll tell my kids, you do not run full tilt after a wounded moose. I'll tell them, be smart, take it easy, think it through. I'll tell them this whole story as a cautionary tale. But to be honest, when I'm laying in bed at night in the safety and comfort of my own home, I do see these sorts of things as fantastic in some strange way. I'm glad they happen. After all, so much of life is safe, and a little bit of danger, in my eyes, isn't such a bad thing. Hunting is and always has been a visceral experience. I know that Neanderthal skeletons show evidence of what anthropologists call a confrontational style of hunting. Fractures, breaks, things you get from mixing it up with big animals.